Ladies and gentlemen, Stuart Cosgrove. Now, Stuart's a bit of a, a renaissance man. Um, you know, known probably among many of you for his Off the Ball uh, program on Radio Scotland. Um, some of you might know him for his television work and his documentaries, but I think what probably fewer of you know is that he started out as an NME journalist and was a, a Northern Soul fanatic. And um, it seems fitting, therefore, that his book um, does chart the um, rise of Motown or the demise of Motown, perhaps better put. And um, really melds the, um, the year 1967 through politics, um, music and counterculture in Detroit. And um, Stuart, I've managed to get to August. It's divided into 12 chapters uh, month by month. Um, it proved to be harder to get a copy than I'd anticipated. So that's a hint to you. Buy it tonight because Waterstones are crap. And I hope they're not sponsoring the event. Actually, uh, Blackwells didn't have it either, just to sort of even things out, okay? Um, but anyway, moving swiftly on, Stuart, how did this come together? How did you end up writing this book? Well, the book, as you say, uh, Olaf, is uh, it's called Detroit 67, The Year That Changed Soul. And it's uh, the history or the autobiography of the city of Detroit in the year 1967. So it follows the 12 chapters and the 12 months of the year from January 1967 to the very uh, end of the um, year. And it follows a number of different kind of threads within the book. Uh, but it begins um, in January uh, in the uh, worst snowstorm in uh, Detroit's history, when almost everyone is, is housebound, where the city is uh, gridlocked, where it's, it's come to a complete close. Uh, and it starts with Barry Gordy, the uh, African-American owner of the Motown Corporation, um, trapped in his home and having to look forward to the year ahead and the range of challenges that he faces, not least of which is internecine warfare between the various members of the Supremes, his most successful group, particularly a fight between Dana Ross and Florence Ballard of the Supremes. And then it takes you all the way through the year, which becomes one of the most catastrophically uh, dramatic years in the city's history. Um, in July, um, Detroit uh, falls under one of the worst uh, urban riots in American history, 43 people killed, 1,500 injured, and the inner city kind of almost uh, gutted and, and uh, burnt to the ground. And then uh, later in the year, uh, it ends with the very last death of the year, which sadly is the death of a young Motown writer, a man called Roger Penzabin, who's just written three of the greatest soul songs of all time. Um, uh, the, the last or the, the most famous of which is I Wish It Would Rain by The Temptations. And uh, basically, it's the story of his uh, love affair with his um, girlfriend who is seeing another man, and he kills himself on the second last day of the year. Uh, and his, last, his, his death is the last death to be um, recorded in the morgue, which has seen so many deaths that year. The book almost tells you the story of many of the deaths that have gone through the morgue. So it's about the story of the city of Detroit, which is the central character of the book, and I think one of the most fascinating and creative cities in the world. I think it, one of the things that I find really interesting was some of the the incidental research where you're you're talking about the you know deaths, but also the at one point the the rise in sexually transmitted diseases, and um, you know I was I was wondering your your research. How did that? How did you pull all these different facts together? Well, I, I said with um, uh, a little bit of kind of information that I, I, I was fascinated by the year. Uh, and it started because um, I'd come across this story uh, about um, Florence Ballard of the Supremes um, giving up and leaving. And I realized that was 1967. And it started in my mind, what else happened that year? And effectively, it took me six years to do this, but I researched every single day of the year, looking at original sources, going over to the um, uh, to the various um, museums and archives in Detroit, and, and tracing the history of, of Motown. Now, uh, there's an interesting thing about this, because since, a ch since I was a child, uh, I grew up 
uh, in uh, Lethem in Perth, and, and uh, I was um, brought up my sister. In fact, there's a young uh, lady there. Where is she? Just round the corner there, um, whose mother was my sister's best friend. I've only just met her for the first time in my life there just now. And uh, this girl so who make was, dreams come yeah, true. Dreams come born true. to be wide. So, so my sister and her best mate, who was uh, called Margaret McGarrigal, that's her daughter over there, um, they were... Perth's first generation mods and they used to carry these records around with them that were imported records and they used to almost treat me like a mini me mod they'd cut my hair they'd force me to wear parkas and I'd go around with them and all the rest of it and they were just a tremendous kind of silent influence in my life they used to know all of these kind of scooter boys and ever and I remember my mum raging one Sunday she said to me they're upstairs with the silver dollars right and the silver dollars were a, a gang from dollar and uh, near Aloha, uh, where, uh, and they were called, they were a mod gang called the Silver Dollars, right? And uh, Margaret McGarrigal and my sister were upstairs with the Silver Dollars. Lord only knows what they were doing with them, you know, but uh, getting inside their park has no doubt. But, um, <laughs> But that, that instilled in me from a very, very early age a deep, deep passion for the music of black America. And it's something that stayed with me throughout my life. It's the abiding passion of my life, much more important to me than any of the other things I'm associated with. Certainly more important than Scottish football. <laughs> <laughs> Who can blame you? Yeah. Uh, so I think one of the things that I find uh, particularly interesting was the, the fact that you have got this uh, black record label that's, yeah. um, that's really come about through this post-war um, self-improvement drive in the yeah. African-American community. And, yeah. you know, everything from the the way that um, they, they set up cooperatives and mm. um, lay yeah. a soft stress on um, on education, right through to Detroit pro providing music tuition for yeah, the, I mean, it's the, the school the, students. The, it, start, it tries to explain why Detroit? Now, there are a number of different reasons for that. One of the primary reasons was that Detroit was probably the, the, the kind of mecca, if you like, for um, black families in the Deep South after post-slavery and all the way on uh, through until the last maybe 50 years. And the Detroit was the place that they aspired to go to work in the car plants, to work in ancillary, ancillary trades. So there was always the perception that there was work in Detroit. And so there was a huge, what they called the Great Migration after the Second World War where Detroit became this place where many black families moved to improve themselves. But self-improvement is, is a kind of core theme within the book. Um, Barry Gordy's family, and particularly the women within the family, were immensely cultivated in terms of entrepreneurship and their education and all the rest of it. And, and as I went through um, their story, you find out that Motown was actually funded by an $800 loan that Barry Gordy got from his own family who would set up a, a, effectively a family cooperative round their table. And when he won the money, the $800 um, for Motown, he was put under tremendous analysis by two of his sisters uh, who suspected that he was just going to blow the money on his favourite music and he'd actually had a jazz shop up in, uh, before that that had gone bust so they were quite suspicious of Motown as a concept and of course it became within a matter of maybe five or six years the greatest African American success story ever so it's a phenomenally interesting uh, story of uh, creative business as much as it is about music you know and I mean he had what like 400 other labels, independent labels yeah, in Detroit I, I just, alone to compete I just, against. I describe it as as the sole Klondike because in, in Detroit there were small four-track uh, recording studios, there were places in people's basements, there was endless amounts of really, really talented singers. I mean, you would not believe um, the amount of kind of uh, singers that came out of uh, Detroit. You talked there about the high school the high school system having training for, um, you know, for classical music, for opera and all the rest of it. So although they were ghetto kids, they had a fantastic education in music. And one of the things that really struck me at the time was each of the schools has their own competitions for who was the, the best band in the school and everything. And if I take one single high school in Detroit, I'm going to choose Pershing High School. It's my fav favorite example. It's where the Four Tops came from. Now, the Four Tops won the award at Pershing for the best band, but two or three years below them was another great group called The Dramatics. And in between that, one of the great rare soul singers of all time, Ronnie McNear. They were all at school together, you know, within a single school and a single high school in the city of Detroit. So it was a real, real place of talent, you know. 
And I think one of the things that um, I liked was the the description of how the expression soul music came about. Yeah. You, have you got that marked out in your book or do you I, want I, to? I have. It's page um, 136. Just, yeah, page 136. Um, I'm going to take the... Take my Gregory Pecks off to do this properly uh, because, as you know, I'm long sighted. It happens when you get to my age. Um, uh, I'm going to do it uh, in order to understand the context here. The first few words uh, strikes have broken out across the city of Detroit. One of the most passionate strikes is uh, local. Uh, dairy farmers, which bears a lot of similarity now here in Scotland, and rather than just take their cows into the local supermarket, they started poisoning the milk and sending poison bottles of milk out in Detroit. And uh, we, we, we follow the scene, it's in Berry Gordy's mother's house, um, and she's holding a party for her old friends and passing the coffee and the tea around. Despite a mild anxiety about poisoned milk, there was a sense of warm achievement in the ranch house on Outer Drive, a neighbourhood where only 10 years earlier, no black family had ever owned property. Although they would never inherit significant wealth themselves, this was the parental generation that had allowed soul music to flourish and who through their quiet resistance and sometimes understated politics had changed the lives of their children forever. Black power could not have existed without their gentle prodding. Carmen Murphy had always been generous with her advice, but she'd made one of another small gesture that helped shape Motown. She offered Berry Gordy the marketing rights to a music label she no longer had any great use for. The label was called Soul. In Murphy's mind, it was a word that looked backwards to the church and the old wooden pews of her own childhood. And sensing that the name might have long-term value, Gordy had a contract drawn up and paid Murphy the agreed peppercorn value of one US dollar. Soul became a Motown subsidiary on which, God, on which Gladys Knight and the Pips, Jimmy Ruffin, Junior Walker and the All-Stars and lesser known artists like Francis Nero ultimately appeared. But more importantly, it came to define a musical genre, symbolizing everything that was transformational about black music, looking forward to the charts and backwards to the Lord. James Brown had noisily called himself the godfather of soul. Aretha Franklin was known as the queen of soul but it was a Detroit beautician with a lace white frock, a floral print handbag, and coconut wax on the tips of her hair who had gifted the term soul to her friend's son and thus to the world. Although Gordy had built his Motown emperor on an image of youthful exuberance and young love, what was less obvious was that a matriarchy of powerful older women had provided the offstage support structures. His mentor, Carmen Murphy, and his mother, Bertha Gordy, were informal advisors to the business. His formidable sisters were ubiquitous at Motown. Lucy Gordy ran the Jubet publishing division until her untimely death through brain cancer in 1965, and her older sister, Esther, occupied senior management roles, eventually becoming Motown's chief executive officer. In an indirect way, this generation of statelier American, uh, African-American women was a safety net, but also a route out of the ghetto thinking that had often trapped black music, none more so than uh, an exquisite an exquisite duchess named Maxine Powell, who ran Motown's charm school and whose job it was to teach the streetwise Motown singers interview techniques table manners and social decorum. She was at times fearful in her pursuit of politeness and was paid to smooth the rough edges from her um, awkward singers and ghetto kids. One member of the Temptations uh, who was particularly resistant to the charm school famously asserted, I don't want to learn how to be white. Mm -hmm. Now, I think this is interesting because one of the, the big contrasts you get in this book is between this, um, this African-American community that's really trying to self-improve, that's setting up businesses and, you know, is really quite a forceful campaigning for civil rights. And then at the same time, in parallel with this, you've got this um, emerging counterculture, um, which revolves around uh, the, the steering committee. Um, yeah. can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about the yeah. steering committee? The steering committee were a group of um, mostly young 
young men um, who had set up shop at the Detroit Artists Workshop in uh, the Wayne uh, State University area of Detroit. And the steering committee, who are again, like Berry Gordy, trapped in the snow at the beginning of the book, ha have made a decision that they want to do nothing more than overthrow America. Uh, they're revolutionaries, they're radicals, um, and uh, they've got this very, very um, uh, uh, radical belief, belief that they can transform America, uh, fight the war in Vietnam, legalize marijuana, and change the system of uh, capitalist system in America. Uh, quite a, quite a uh, interesting kind of statement about America at that time because uh, three members of the steering committee in the, the, the following year go on to blow up the offices of the CIA in Michigan and one of them ends up being at the top of the FBI's most wanted list. So they were not fucking about. You know, these were people that had a real sense of wanting change. They're white, they were young, they were artists, and one of them becomes the manager of one of Detroit's most famous garage rock bands, M MC5, uh, the Motor City Five. Uh, his name is John Sinclair. He's still even now a global activist in legalizing marijuana. But there's a great quote in the book, and I know it's one you like. I'll yeah, let you do the honors. Yeah, I honors. think that this is... Um in one audacious manifesto, they threatened to disrupt Detroit with rock music, declaring a total assault on the culture by any means necessary, including rock and roll, dope, and fucking in the streets. Yeah. Um, I imagine that have been a bit difficult at the point where the book starts because there were several feet of snow, but... Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, they... you try it in Perth, forget Detroit, you know? <laughs> You'd be in the fucking jail for three months. <laughs> um, so this seems to, as the book progresses, it seems that they there is mention of this uh, this big loving that they um, they try yeah, to the, have the, on the they, they have on one island. of the, the first actually I think in the USA. Uh, there's a tendency to kind of look at the love generation as being something that emerged out of San Francisco, but the steering committee were running um, uh, lovins in Detroit in the April of the year prior to the summer, and in actual fact uh, it was one that ended in a mini riot as well. So there was a tendency in Detroit for it all to spark off and never be quite the love childs of, or children of San Francisco. But they're a great part of the book and they follow the story all the way through. They're the kind of B story. Motown and uh, black American music's the A story and they're the B story throughout the book. Um, and it gives you a fascinating insight into the politics and the war in Vietnam where the, the cover is derived from. I've read quite a lot of these different uh, different types of music based books, but one of, the, uh, one of my favorites that really does uh, blend the origins of a particular type of music um, is bass culture. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had any books that have really um, influenced you like uh, Lloyd Bradley's um, did. I mean, I think yeah. they, that's one of the ones that really does seem to have the, the politics and the music. Yeah, the well, Lloyd actually, curiously enough, was somebody I'd know well and had worked with at Black Echoes prior to uh, joining the NME. So, yeah, that, that was one obvious example, and, and there are others, but I was actually following a slightly different route. I'd, I'd graduated in um, uh, theater and English, and then I did a PhD in American uh, history. And so for me, the politics of civil rights and the, the, the history books were the, were the biggies. And there's a great book uh, by a professor, Sidney Fine, which is about the social crisis of urban America. And that was a book that I read inside out and became obsessed with. Um, but the real obsession started when I was a kid, when I started to collect Motown and then rarer R&B records, and then ultimately got um, uh, you know um, seduced into the rare northern soul scene, which has been my abiding passion um, throughout my life and you know the, the the book if you read the book as a kind of treatise of why people in Britain are obsessed with northern soul there's a little kind of nuggets in there for the kind of obscure soul fans because you you, you know got to keep them happy you know they're thinking Stuart's going to write this book about Detroit it'll be wall-to-wall -wall trivia and I wanted to write something much grander and bigger and more relevant than that but you've got to chuck in the wee bits of well trivia. I quite like you chucking in these Scottish bits as well like the um, the threatened strike 
like um, when the when a Motown uh, tour was was actually about to play in Glasgow. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the first ever attempt to uh, strike of the Motown artists, the f famous uh, Funk Brothers, happened when they were in '65 when they were touring the UK. It was a pretty catastrophically awful tour, and they ended up in Glasgow. And the backing musicians said, "That's it. We're not going on for the Glasgow concert unless we get cash money. We're not." having this thing about, you know, you'll give us it when we get home, we want the money now. And Barry Gordy had to get money wired over to a bank in Renfield Street and go and get the cash and hand it out to the <laughs> Funk Brothers. So that's in there as a little nod to Scotland. There's another nod to Scotland as well, where uh, one of the leaders of the motor, the the big strike at the in the car plants in the uh, summer of the year, the spring of the year, um, is led by a man called Doug Fraser, who's from Paisley, and he's the uh, he's the workers union guy um, leading the the, the car workers uh, strike. And the interesting thing about it is it's not in the book because I've only since discovered it that um, one of the Funk Brothers, um, uh, James Jamerson, one of the most famous uh, backing musicians for Motown, had this habit of speaking in a Scottish accent. Now, he's from South Carolina, right? So clearly he'd picked it up in the way. And he would turn around and scare uh, young musicians with this growling voice. Get down there, sit there, do that. All this kind of stuff, right? He was, you know, black as the ace of spades and he was from South Carolina. And he had only been to Scotland once when he was part of the strike that got the money from Renfield Street. And what had happened was I found out subsequently, I asked uh, someone who was there, why, why do you think he had this idea that he was Scottish? Where did that come from? And he said, well, probably at the time, he, he was a kind of shop steward within Studio A at the Snake Pit in, in um, Motown. And he said, probably at the time, he was hearing Doug Fraser on the radio uh, doing these kind of peons to kind of striking. And he was the guy who would turn around and say, unless the management sort this by Thursday, we'll bring the place to a close. And he was doing all of this kind of stuff. And he was picking up on this shit and started to pretend he was Scottish, you know, which is okay because I've tried to pretend I'm from Detroit for the most well, of my life. Well, I was going to, I was going to ask you about this because yeah. you said that you're going to, yeah, you're likely to piss off some of your Northern soulmates by writing everything in American English, except you use polystyrene instead of styrofoam, I thought I'd pick you yeah, up on yeah, that okay, one. There you but go. other yeah, than yeah. that, um, <laughs> there you you're, go. you're talking I about... I knew you'd get me, eh? <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about freeways, you've, you've yeah. resorted to American spelling. Why did you do that? Was there a Well, for uh, it? first and foremost, became because it came out in America first. Right. Secondly, because America is... Uh, a bigger market and uh, it's sold very well in America. Admittedly, that's uh, online through Amazon. It's the number one bestseller for soul and blues and R&B. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, via Amazon, which I know gets a real hard time and I'm willing to kind of talk about those uh, elements of it. But the interesting thing about it is uh, Amazon's recommendation algorithms um, uh, are, are perfect for a book like this because uh, if you buy, if someone goes on Amazon and they buy Marvin, a Marvin Gaye CD, my book's recommended right. because of the recommendation uh, or, or, that it works through. Now, I'm not saying that that necessarily makes it easy for independent bookstores, but I've flogged my guts getting it into every independent bookstore that I could. And in the end, Waterston said they didn't want to stock it because it was um, too big. <laughs> It's not that big. It's look, too I fucking have... big. I mean, <laughs> do you know what? I felt like writing to Watersons and saying, Dear Mr. Watterson, I know some really good joiners in Perth that can help you with your shelves. <laughs> too fucking big, you know? <laughs> So did you publish it yourself then? Yes, I did, yeah. Well, through a company called Clayton Media, which is publishing house I took. And I made the decision to do that for one very, very simple reason. I had two uh, very good publishers that were going to publish it with me. And both of them uh, came to me with the same thought. And I can understand why they arrived at this, because they see things through the aspect of, of book publishing. And they said, firstly, that the book's too long and we need to cut it by half. So it's 650 pages, needs to be about 300. And we would prefer for there to be a, a, a full color 
color cover with the Supremes on the cover. There's a, a black soldier from Vietnam on the cover. And I kind of felt to myself, well, it's not the story of the Supremes. It's not actually a biography of a Motown artist. It's not even the story of Motown. It's the story of the city of Detroit in the year 1967. And I wanted it to be the way it was. So I went forward with self-publishing. I'm a great believer in independent publishing anyway, uh, across all, you know, whether that's in music or whether it's in uh, book publishing or whatever. So that's what I decided to do. It was right for me. It's not right for everybody. But, you know, here's the interesting thing is I've been out selling the book, and I'm meaning selling it, uh, across the counter at Rare and Northern Soul Clubs for the last six months. And, you know, there's a hardback version of it up there, 25 quid, fucking great value, right? Um, <laughs> and the interesting thing about it is if you're in a Northern Soul Club, when you spend 400 quid on a record, 25 quid for a book's a piece of piss, you know? <laughs> so I didn't it's accept their theory that the book has to be £9.99. The book's actually uh, £18, and it's, uh, it's a fantastic read. And get it tonight because yeah. you're you're not going to be able to get it in Waterstones. Um, it's it's yeah. too big. Um, yeah, get yeah. it from the source. It seems to me there are incredible parallels between the Detroit 1967 and what happened in Detroit with the the collapse of the banks. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you've been you've been there in recent years. I mean, what's it what's it like? Well, um, firstly, going back to. Um, the uh, 67 period, the riots of 1967 caused a kind of seizure in the kind of self-confidence of Detroit, which they never really ever got over. And the, the last chapter, which is called Flight, talks about the people leaving Detroit for the suburbs and eventually, of course, Motown leaves and moves to Los Angeles and whatever. So the flight from Detroit is the kind of end of the book. But Detroit had one really fascinating point of difference. We tend to think about ghettos in America uh, as always being the same. There's a tendency in your mind to think of maybe the, 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 the big apartments and flats of Detroit or Chicago or uh, New York and thinking of them as being high rises and difficult places to go. Uh, Inner city Detroit's very different. They, they refer to them almost as prairie ghettos because the, the landscape, because it's been based on cars, is very wide and spread out. And often there are huge gaps between buildings. And uh, effectively, um, prairies or the kind of forests and that have literally regrouped and taken over the city. So it's a place that artists have recolonized. There's a period where you could buy a, a, a whole block for $20 uh, and you had to rebuild it. The presumption was you would rebuild it. And now, a wee bit like where Glasgow was in the uh, late 80s, it's been re reconvened now as a creative city. And the Lower East Side, or the, rather the Eastern Market side of Detroit, is now a very, very cool place to go if you're an artist or if you're a band or whatever. So it's, it's, it's fighting back and uh, long may it do so. It's a phenomenally brilliant city. You must visit it. And this book's about one part of its history, 1967, but it's not the story of Detroit, it's the story of that year. So, I mean, are you, um, are you seeing kind of buildings being knocked down and turned back into fields? Yeah, well, f firstly into fields, but also into um, museums, into art galleries, into all sorts of things going on, social uh, entrepreneurship and whatever. Uh, but there's a story in the book, there's a book about, uh, there's a story about housing in it. And there's a, a great um, rare soul singer, a woman called Lee Dawson, uh, who recorded on an indie label called uh, Magic City Records. And Lee Dawson um, is living in a, a, a place where there's some landlords. One of her children gets bit, bitten by a rat. There's been an outbreak of Norwegian rats in the city in this part of the book. And she decides that she's going to... Uh, promote better housing through her music. And she turns up at demos and street corners and all the rest of it. She never makes it to Motown. She doesn't become hugely famous, but she's a, a brilliant, great creative soul singer uh, who also had the, the, the will to fight la slum landlords and whatever. So, you know, there's, there's all of that in the book as well. Stuart. What's up next? Are you? Uh, well, uh, two things. This is the first part of a soul trilogy. The next up is um, Memphis '68, and after that, Harlem '69. The books are really the end of um, the the soul scene. But I've um, just agreed also to write the social history of Northern Soul, which I'm doing with Berlin, the um, Edinburgh-based publisher. In fact, Alison, who's publishing the book, is sitting over there uh, in the middle. Hi, Al. How are you? And uh, uh, she's um, already commissioned the book, which is great. 300 words, 300 pages, rather. <laughs>
and a colour right. photo of the Supremes. I'm like, I'll be fucking right. Excellent. <laughs> Stuart, thanks very much. Thank you. Nice uh, to meet you. Cheers. Thank you. And don't, uh, don't get up yet. You've got a best seat for uh, watching Dead Rabbit.